gentlemen, welcome to the dedication of the F. Edward A. Bear School of Medicine. Will you please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Joint Armed Services Color Guard and remain standing for the national anthem played by the United States Marine Corps Band and the invocation delivered by Chaplain Barstead, United States Air Force. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will look upon us with your favor this day as we celebrate the gift of life and this significant event. In the words of the prophet Joel, you spoke of old men dreaming dreams and young men seeing visions. A dream has become a reality and the vision is now fulfilled, and for that we give you thanks. And especially for all those who have helped to make it happen. May this F. Edward Hebert School of Medicine always be dedicated to providing competent and compassionate physicians who will help to bring health and wholeness to a broken and anxious world. Grant to all who come here to learn and those who teach the joy and fulfillment that comes from enhancing and enriching the lives of others. Bless, we pray, our nation and its leaders as they seek to fulfill their responsibilities. Be with all the members of the armed forces throughout the world in their mission as peacekeepers, and enable all of us to work aggressively to become peacemakers at every level of life. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Retire the colors. <clears throat>
Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present Dr. J.P. Sanford, President of the Uniformed Services University and Dean of the F. Edward A. Bear School of Medicine, who will preside during the dedication. Senator Johnson, Mrs. Dewey, distinguished members of Congress, staff, members of the Board of Regents, especially the emeritus members, fellow faculty, staff, students, ladies and gentlemen. Today is an important milestone in the growth and development of Mr. Hebert's vision. In September 1975, I had the opportunity to meet with him and to gain more insight into his views. He was committed to assuring the health and providing for the care of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, wherever they might be stationed in the world, whether during peacetime or at war. This vision and dedication have served to guide the recruitment of our faculty, development of our curriculum, and selection of our students. We are developing an outstanding institution of which Mr. Hebert can continue to look on with pride. At this time, I pledge that we will continue to focus our mission, which is the provision of medical education of the highest quality to assure a cadre of outstanding medical officers who are prepared to assure the health and provide care to our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Honorable David I. Olch, Chairman of the Board of Regents, who will make a few remarks and introduce the guest speaker. Dr. Olch. Thank you, Dr. Sanford. <clears throat> Senator Johnson, Mr. Chairman Price, Mrs. Dewey, distinguished senators and members of Congress, distinguished military and civilian guests, esteemed friends, ladies and gentlemen. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome you to the dedication of the F. Edward A. Bear School of Medicine of the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. It has been nearly 10 years since January, I'm sorry, July 10th, 1975, when the ground was broken for this campus in the courtyard in which we are now assembled. At the time of that historic groundbreaking, Congressman F. Edward A. Bear stood here and spoke eloquently of his 25-year effort to establish this school. He spoke of his vision for a military academy of uniformed medical officers, a West Point for military physicians. In his speech that July day in 1975, he said, this University of Military Science and Health Sciences is going to be the focus point and the rallying point and the center point for the best in military medicine. It has the greatest potential of any university in the world. As we look around this courtyard today, the courtyard of the F. Ever Ed F. Edward A. Bear School of Medicine, we see the flowering of the potential seen by Mr. A. Bear and his colleagues in the United States Congress. As we look over this campus, we see these student officers, our concerned and talented civilian and military faculty, and a dedicated administration and staff. As we look beyond this courtyard, we see five classes of uniformed medical officers who have graduated from this school and who are now serving their nation in a variety of assignments around the world. These medical officers are ready to serve wherever, whatever the contingency. They are concerned and compassionate medical officers born of a unique and comprehensive curriculum, combining talented traditional medical education with military medical training. This 
Military medical training prepares them for all possible assignments, whether operating a battalion aid station or a busy clinic in a modern military medical center. Our graduates are the core of career-oriented military medical officers who proudly serve this nation and who confidently serve the military line community. These graduates are a testimonial to the fact that there is more to creating a uniformed medical officer than putting a physician in uniform. I am here today, as are the other members of the Board of Regents, the Surgeons General of the Uniformed Services, you distinguished guests, and the assembled university to bear witness to the vision of Congressman Hebert and to express thanks for the continued support of the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences by the United States Congress. It is appropriate that we reflect on this portion of the life work of Congressman Hebert. I did not personally know Congressman Hebert. I wish that I had had that privilege. Through my association with this university, I believe I have gained some understanding into how much this distinguished legislator and public servant from New Orleans cared about the well-being of the young men and women who serve in our armed forces. We have with us today a distinguished senator who knew Mr. Hebert well and who understood his vision to create a military medical academy. Senator J. Bennett Johnson of Louisiana, from his own experience, understands the central role of the Staff Corps officer in the military, for he served in the Army Judge Advocate General Corps following undergraduate law, law work at the, at the U.S. Military Academy and Louisiana State University Law School. Senator Johnson was recently appointed to the Senate Special Committee on Aging. He is the current ranking minority member of the Senate Committee on Energy and National Resources. He serves on the Senate Appropriation Committee and is the ranking Democrat on the Subcommittee on Energy and Water Development. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, it is my great pleasure to introduce a true friend of the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences, our guest speaker and distinguished senator from the state of Louisiana, the Honorable J. Bennett Johnson. Thank you very much, Dr. Olsh, distinguished platform guests, my colleagues in the Congress, Mrs. Dewey, ladies and gentlemen. We are here today in a labor of love and commemoration to rename this great school of medicine after F. Edward A. Bear, my dear friend and colleague in the Congress from Louisiana. Eddie A. Bear was born and reared and lived all his life in Louisiana, except when he was in the Congress. Even as a young man, he demonstrated tremendous qualities of leadership, success at winning school elections, and a gift of oratory. For example, under Eddie A. Bear's picture in the Jesuit High School yearbook is the class prophecy that says, Choose any office of the land, and it shall be thine. He was a graduate of Tulane, the first freshman in the history of the university to win a debating championship, and he began what appeared to be a lifelong career in journalism after he left Tulane. Eddie, in fact, started his career as a journalist. He became known for his candid, very hard-hitting political reporting. He exposed scandals in Louisiana uh, in the mid-1930s. And in 1940, Eddie was elected to the Congress of the United States for the first time. At that time, he say, said he planned to serve only one two-year term, that as an ex-congressman, he would permanently have the privileges of the floor, and therefore one term would be enough so he could return to his journalism. He gleefully projected the advantage to coverage such ex uh, access would be to a reporter. Eddie made his initial impact in the Congress again as an investigator. In the early 1940s, he investigated the District of Columbia's police department, which resulted in the complete reorganization of that department. In 1942, he decided to seek re-election, and he was returned to Congress each year from 
1940 until 1977. In 1945, Eddie became a member of the House Committee on Naval Affairs, of which Lyndon Johnson was then chairman. He conducted a number of investig investigatory hearings as early as the late 1940s on the issues, on such issues as overcharges in defense contracts, the airplane industry, weapons systems management, and alleged influence of retired officers in the Defense Department. I, I, I note that Eddie has not solved all of those problems yet. <laughs> Abair was handpicked by the then chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Carl Vinson, to chair the investigating committee. He eventually became chairman of the Armed Services Committee in the House. He became a defender and champion of the American serviceman. He also continued to conduct investigations. For example, he was selected to head the My Lai investigation for the House Armed Services Committee during the Vietnam War. Comments of Hebert's colleagues tell us much about him. Carl Vinson, for example, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, said as follows about Eddie Hebert, quote, Eddie Hebert has done a magnificent job in Congress. He is one of the most able men I have seen come to Congress during the more than 30 years I have been here. And Mendel Rivers, who succeeded Carl Vinson as chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, said this, Eddie Hebert is without a doubt the most unusual character I have ever known. And when I say character, I mean all the good that that world, word implies. He is a man of most unusual accomplishments. He's one of the best informed men one could ever possibly meet. He works hard, he works tirelessly, and he gives the extra effort to perfect any legislation coming under his jurisdiction. That brings me to Eddie's role in the establishment of this great school. As early as 1947, Hebert was concerned about the ability of the Department of Defense to recruit, train, and retain physicians of the highest quality. That year, he raised the possibility of establishing a West Point for doctors. In fact, 40 years ago, there was a dialogue between the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, one Dwight David Eisenhower, and Hebert about this, about this very subject in a congressional hearing. The idea languished until 1961 when Hebert introduced a bill calling for the establishment of a military medical school. He argued that if the government could find military academies to train soldiers, sailors, and airmen, then it should also be able to have an academy, uh, academy to train doctors for these very same soldiers, sail, sailors, and airmen. For 10 years, no further action was taken. In 1971, all of that changed when the Secretary of Defense, Mel Laird, supported the military medical school proposal. The legislation passed the House of Representatives with 352 votes. Through the, though the Senate had not included the school in its version of the legislation, the conference committee retained the school and it was enacted into law in 1972. In 1973, the Board of Regents was confirmed by the Senate, and in 1975, President Ford broke ground for this wonderful new building and where the school is now housed. But the story does not end there. There were those in both the House and the Senate who in 1975 and 1976 felt that the cost of the school was excessive. They tried unsuccessfully even as construction proceeded to terminate, proceeded to terminate the school's existence. The charter class entered the university in August of 1976, and shortly thereafter, my first involvement in the school became aware. I can very well remember the events of 1977. At that time, I was chairman of the Military Construction Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. President Carter had just taken office and sent to the Congress a set of amendments to the fiscal year 1978 budget. We were concerned even then about balanced budgets and high deficits. 
One such amendment proposed to close the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. Some $80 million in military construction funds had already been appropriated, and most of that money had already been obligated. Construction of the building was half complete. I can remember Eddie's call to me in early 1977. Frankly, at that time, I hadn't known much about this school. I knew that Eddie Hebert was behind a military medical school, but I didn't know much about it. And quite frankly, I was rather skeptical. Of course, uh, the Hebert treatment is a very, it was at that time a very famous treatment. Once you got the treatment from Eddie Hebert, it was difficult to disagree with Eddie. And I, I switched from a lukewarm skeptic about the medical school to the second strongest supporter on the Hill only after Eddie Hebert, because such were the powers of his persu persuasion. Well, we had a hearing. Uh, in the Appropriations Committee, and remember it very well. I remember Senator Claude Pepper came over and testified. That was my first time to hear Claude Pepper, very, very eloquent. David Packard, who later was uh, chairman, I guess he was at that time chairman of the Board of Regents, and a very strong uh, backbone in the creation, foundation, and uh, support of this school, uh, with other leading lights who testified about the need to not only not terminate this school, but continue uh, and, and, and provide for its role of excellence. Well, we won in the committee. We won on the floor of the Senate after a very determined fight about this question of whether or not it was cost effective to proceed with a medical school or whether we should continue to recruit doctors from these civilian medical schools. We won by 56 to 30, and a few days later, the bill went to conference. Our good colleagues in the House, of course, uh, aided us in retaining the language and the appropriation, and the school was off to a flying start. It has been a tremendous success story. We like to talk about our successes in the Congress because Unfortunately, not everything we are behind uh, turns out to be a roaring success, but this is one, and therefore we like to celebrate it as we are here today. The school was created, of course, to train a cadre of career, and I stress career, military medical officers. There is a vast difference between a career officer who is committed to the services, to its mission, to its, even its folkways, and to those who come in for a short period of time while they uh, serve a couple of years before they go out and make their fortune on the outside, there's a vast difference between those two kinds of medical officers. This school is committed to the former. It is committed to the development of military medical officers imbued with a sense of military ethics, predisposed as an active duty officer to remain with the military medical uh, departments for a career, and then trained, military, uh, trained in militarily relevant subjects, such as military medicine, military applied physiology, parasitology, preventive medicine, advanced trauma life support, advanced cardiac support, and combat casualty care are subjects that are not readily available in most of our and the civilian counterpart schools. There are currently enrolled in this school 629 medical students and 106 graduate students. The first class of 29 students graduated in 1980. To date, 443 students have graduated from the school. The class of 1988 had almost 4,000 applications for 158 positions, some 25 applicants for every available position. So as you look out at those uh, uh, very sharp-looking students out there, you will know that they are one out of 25. Lucky to be here, and we're lucky that they are here. 
Of the matriculants in the class of 1988, the average grade point, the, the gra average grade point average is 3.5. The mission of the university is set out in its, by its first president, Dr. Anthony Carreri, has been fulfilled. Dr. Carreri said that the mission was, and I quote, to train a cadre of motivated, dedicated young men who will be serving global medicine in terms of cure and control. Moreover, they will be able to mobilize and deploy rapidly as teams to meet military and, and civilian crises, to provide humanistic as well as scientific care to the sick and injured. In addition, this university will provide opportunities for aspiring young military officers to attain academic recognition and support continuing education of health providers. Finally, it will be one of the main sources in the United States in developing optimum models for the study of health care and health education. Our country has focused recently on readiness in the armed forces. Medical readiness is just as important a form of readiness as is combat readiness. In time of war, if we lack, lack the medical, medical uh, facilities and personnel to care for our wounded, then we will lack the sustainability to continue to fight. In addition to normal medical school training, though, there is a large curriculum component that is keyed specifically to the military mission. This is what makes the Hebert School of Medicine a unique institution and a unique national resource. Eddie Hebert has written a wonderful autobiography published in 1976. The book devotes an entire chapter to his work to create this institution. I'd like to read you just uh, one chapter of what he says about this school. Still, there is a deep satisfaction for me in the fact that the medical school is now a reality. The Surgeon General of the Navy, Admiral Curtis, has said that I will be known as the father of military medicine, and that, too, gives me great satisfaction. When my service is ended, I look back over the milestones of my career. I want most of all to be remembered for the military medical school. It will live long after those of us who read this are dead. You know, Eddie was right. It will live, live long after those of us who are here today are no longer here. And he, Eddie was also right in that he will, he will be remembered for this school, which so appropriately from this day forward will bear his name. There could be no more fitting testament for someone who believed deeply in the correctness of a cause and who worked for 30 years to see that it came into fruition. For those of us who knew Eddie Hebert, we respected his spirit of individuality, his character, as someone pointed out, his independence, his great confidence in America. I trust that that spirit will be a model for each and every student who passes through this institution en route to a great career in the service of our country. Thank you very much. It is now my uh, distinct honor and privilege uh, to uh, introduce Mrs. Dawn Hebert Dewey, daughter uh, of Congressman Hebert, uh, who may make a few remarks uh, and who will then unveil the F. Edward Hebert Memorial. Mrs. Dewey. Thank you very much. Bennett, you did a wonderful job bringing everybody up to date on exactly how we got here today. I just wanted to say something personally because, yes, Daddy was a great man as far as the public's concerned, and he was a great man as far as I was concerned and my family was. My mother wanted me to express to you all the fact that she is thinking about you today. She wished that she could be here. She knows how very important a day this is for my father, and it is for us as well. And for myself, 
my daughter Jeanne, who's here with me today, all of our friends who have, are here and who have lived through this in a very personal way, I want to say thank you for my daddy, for my friends, and for my family. It is a wonderful day and is a fitting end to a very long, long career. Thank you. I want to say one other comment before I sit down. This particular bust is, for those of you who knew Daddy and for those of you who did not, oftentimes people have things like this done and everyone comes along and says, oh, it doesn't look a thing like him. Believe me, that's him. <laughs> Will well, everybody please rise for the benediction. Chaplain Barstead. And now as we go forth into this exciting world, may God pour his spirit upon us that we might continue to dream dreams and to see visions and to see our world not just as it is, but by God's help, what it might be. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the ceremony. Dismiss the formations. <laughs>